My name is Jess Bland. I'm Deputy Director of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk here at the University of Cambridge. Um, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first public lecture um, of this academic year. And to be honest, our, our second public lecture in person for quite a number of years. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you all in the room. And it's a real pleasure to in, invite um, Arati Krishnan all the way from New York, um, where she works in UNDP to speak, um, someone who I have spoken to many times online during COVID, but have rarely had the opportunity um, to meet in person. So it's been, it's been a great couple of days. Um, the topic or the, the main headline for today's lecture is grey mirror. Um, and we use this phrase because we wanted to play with a particular tension that comes in our work of thinking of these high impact, low probability events, these catastrophes or existential risks that might exist in our future, um, where often Black Mirror, the Netflix series, or in fact, Don't Look Up, um, the recent Hollywood blockbuster, are these kind of memes of particular very vivid futures that come up and over and over again when we're speaking to policymakers or the public uh, about what we do. And so they're really helpful. They open the doors, particular decision-making spaces, um, and they can help us explain how what is sometimes seen as esoteric academic work is something that is relatable to others. However, they have this really difficult thing that comes with that vividness of thinking about the future. They are really produced by you know, our most contemporary media with millions, if not billions, of viewers for Black Mirror. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and that means that sometimes they can displace the other features, perhaps the ones that might come about in my local community or might come about in a, an, in a nation that I'm visiting to do policy work. Um, and instead of thinking through with those who are going to realise those other features, who are going to make them happen, what will really happen, um, which is messier and greyer, one might say, than this single vivid black mirror, um, we end up talking about these memes and talking about science fiction or talking about Hollywood. And that's not helpful because the future is highly uncertain. We don't know which future is going to emerge. And to be really prepared for any of those, we need to be able to manage this struggle between the complex messiness of creating futures together and hearing the perspectives from a lot of people in the systems that will be part of that future and the clarity and mass appeal, you might say, um, of these single vivid futures. And that tension between mass creation and mass appeal, although I learned from some of my um, communication scholar colleagues recently that the word mass has perhaps too many political overtones to use it um, in this case, but that's how I've, I've seen it previously, is a, really, is a really big tension and one that Arati is going to speak to more in her lecture later about anticipation um, and how perhaps this uncertainty about the future is actually an opportunity. It's actually a space to bring ideas of equality and justice into our thinking about the future, rather than allowing a few vivid images um, to take over. Um, going forward, we've been thinking about this um, at CESA quite a lot. Um, we started off doing work that was horizon scanning, so really bringing emerging issues from the science community to policymaking. But increasingly, we realize, in collaboration with those policymakers we speak to, um, that that's not quite enough, that you need to bring something up that is not necessarily a black mirror, but certainly gets into the mind of those people making decisions as much as those black mirror features do. And so moving into perhaps our second day, decade of CESA, we're thinking more and more about how we play in this space of futures and foresight, but with this responsibility um, for not just repeating the memes of Hollywood in our work and perhaps thinking of how we use that instead as an opportunity for bringing different views in, for thinking about how we respond to catastrophe as a global population and not just a few of us in Cambridge or California. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Rati, who's going to speak um, for 25 or so minutes. We then have um, a few people who I'll introduce in a bit who will respond, um, who I've invited particularly because they really represent <laughs> a great breadth of thinking in the UK um, on this topic. Um, with that kind of announcement from Water. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you take over. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, now, Jess made fun of me earlier because I've been trained to not turn up without my speaking notes. Um, and she's like, you turned up with speaking notes? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so if I'm looking at my uh, laptop, that's why. 
Um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much to this esteemed group of panelists, to all of you here. It's my great privilege uh, to be here with you today. Um, so where I was asked to speak about is uncertainty about the future an opportunity for equality. Sociologist Zainab Tafukchi once said that history is full of massive harm done by people with great power who are utterly convinced that because they believe themselves to have good intentions, they cannot do harm or cause grave harm. My name is Arathi Krishnan. I am Malaysian, I am Australian, I am of Indian heritage and of two different castes. I have lived in many, many countries and I currently live on the ancestral Lenape homelands now known as New York. I'm an immigrant, I'm a cis woman of color. I have worked in humanitarian and development aid for almost two decades, it's a very long time. And I now focus on anticipatory governance in the face of emerging risk and crises. And I, as well, I research on ethics and decolonial governance frames in technology futures. I stand here on the shoulders of all those that come before me, and I have an obligation to all those that come after me. The common threads through my career are the questions of how do we serve all of humanity without bringing the inequities of our past into our futures. This isn't merely a technical or intellectual pursuit, but a deeply personal one, driven by the notion that it's often people that look like me that come from the communities I come from who are often denied voice. We are spoken on behalf of when it comes to the choices available to us for our futures. So it is in this vein that I ask these questions. As, complex, as complexity and uncertainty cast a hue over, over our understanding of ourselves and in our place in the world, it also provokes new answers to this question. What does it mean to be human in these 21st centuries? Like so many of us here today, um, I am at the invitation of the Center for Existential Risk, after all. I am not particularly hopeful of our futures that we will be ancestors of. Global governance systems seemingly keep being taken by surprise, always one step behind shocks, conflict, new complex disasters, new vulnerabilities. The approaches seem to remain the same, albeit tutored as improved. Has it improved, though? When people continue to be left behind, when we don't see new types of vulnerabilities, when we are not prepared for new emerging crises and risks, we assume our approaches, tinkered with at the sides, are enough to respond to anything that comes our way. But what we are facing in the next decade is not anything we have experienced before at the scale that we will be experiencing it. We are going to be experiencing compounding, intersecting systemic and existential risk. We are going to be experiencing the types of disasters and devastation at a scale that we haven't yet experienced. We are going to experience the types of wars that bypass our rigidly held principles, values, and rules, where not everyone really cares about abiding by. We are going to be experiencing the types of injustice, inhumanity, agony, despair not seen in decades, perpetuating historical systemic oppression that already undergirds so much of humanity today. And what we are grappling with is more than just an increase of risks. Looming larger is the resulting surge in uncertainty. One example this year alone, the conflict in Ukraine, compounded by global events related to climate risks and food production constraints, led to heightened vulnerability in Pakistan across numerous dimensions. This was even before the massive flooding that occurred a few weeks ago. What Pakistan was experiencing was severe wheat shortages to a reduced energy supply. Examples like this also underscore the reality that in the Anthropocene, the local is no longer local, the global is not just global. With patterns and processes that may rapidly disperse as a consequence of scale, connectivity, and speed. 
What this means is that our traditional risk analysis frameworks for a policy or program has to account not just for the known variables, but for the unknowns, for the things that we are uncertain about, including the ways the outcomes of a local intervention may be influenced by and trigger elects in other areas and regions and across different timescales. As our recent UNDP Human Development Report uh, cited this year, the layering and interactions of multidimensional risks and the overlapping of threats give rise to new dimensions of uncertainty. If for no other reason than human choices have impacts well beyond our weakened social ecological systems capacities to absorb them. I echo Indy Johar's arguments that put forward that these types of exponential, intersecting, multidimensional risks and uncertainties that we are experiencing and will continue to experience makes it almost impossible to govern and subsequently to assign accountability. These types of risks and uncertainties that are not priceable in our existing accounting methods, society and economy, and thus get left ignored. How then do we price the risks to human life, to planetary existence? Conversely, how do we price or value the risk to civilization breakdown? And when we can't price them, nor govern them, nor assign accountability, then now as always, the historically oppressed and marginalized continue to carry the brunt of impact. And this is a big red flag that points not to just tinkers of the system, it points to the fault line in our risk governance systems that are not able to, not equipped to deal with downstream, downstream accountability over multiple timelines. We are living in the days of future history lessons. Our comments have fundamentally and irrevocably shifted. We now know that we can't build back to what it was before. Our systems, our societies, our actions and behaviors, these were multiple fault lines that were tearing in the wounds of our ecosystem, and it's now rupturing at its sides, demonstrating the multitudes of ways in which we have all failed. We have failed in ways that keep poor people poor. We have failed to make healthcare, healthcare accessible and sustainable for all. We have failed to safeguard our planet. We have failed to wait, make the world more equal, more just, more safe. We have failed not because the challenges were insurmountable, but because of our collective lethargy and apathy to truly reimagine a completely different status quo. The need to address these issues has been seen a surge in the push for long-term thinking, for strategic foresight, for being anticipatory in the face of emerging risks. Global governance of foresight and risk, in practice, attempt to blend imaginations of what the future might be with actions in the present that require changes in our policies, our practices, our funding mechanisms, our risk mechanisms, decision making. But these realms of imaginations and design of democracy, progress, social good, and what it means to thrive have traditionally followed a static, rigid view of these ideas, steeped in pillars of a northern-dominated world order. We limit the possibilities of what might evolve in our world to four binary scenarios, as if these scenarios are the only things available to all of us, without considering the interconnectedness of risk and complexity that drive how human beings live. The very practice of foresight of thinking about the future can be deeply steeped in bias and surface only local rhetoric without interrogating what is needed for us to change. As a result, these futures can easily be mistaken as self-evident truths. And what is the result of futures that become a self-evident truth or singular truth? These singular truths for the future result in policy design that is created with very narrow ideas about humanity. We saw this in pandemic policies designed for wealthy countries and blindly rolled out across the world. These policies were not designed with considerations for migrant workers or for communities that are unable to, so, unable to socially distance. 
the poor, the uninsured, the disenfranchised, the information poor, and the less mobile are bearing the brunt of our decisions. And to understand why, we must look back at our history. I have often argued that global governance systems for foresight perpetuate hierarchical, patriarchal, hegemonic views of what development and progress looks like, ignoring other worldviews, and underlying and structural pillars of inequality and bias. They were developed in imperial systems, meaning that based on our colonial legacies of the global north and the global south, in a way that allows supremacy and arguably racial hierarchies to go unchallenged and possibly even to thrive. The agonies that our world is facing today didn't happen overnight. It is as the result of the shared history of colonialism, where solutions are always offered in the name and the good of those being colonized, but they themselves are not recognized to be legitimately part of those producing the solutions. The act of colonialism or colonization removes power from the colonized, dispossesses and transfers economic resources and removes culture in the name of civility of modernization. It isn't just physical, it's also mental and metaphysical. It presents itself as a matrix of power that operates through control or hegemony over the economy, including land, labor, natural resources, authority, gender and sexuality, of subjectivity, of knowledge. It was presented to the world of mo as modernization, but this was at a grave expense to freedom, to justice, to equality, and to a very homogenous worldview. How we then conceive and transfer knowledge, as well as what knowledge we see as credible and valid are also based on these colonial beliefs how we exist within these structures, and how we interpret reality is deeply influenced by this as well. And all of these come together to paint a mosaic of how normal is understood. This isn't the only privileging force that our global system sometimes upholds. It also upholds forces like patriarchy, race and ethnicity, caste, bias, paternalism, hetero and cis normativity, classism and class privilege, ableism, ageism. As Ruha Benjamin provokes, who and what gets fixed in place to enable progress? What social groups are classified, corralled, coerced, and capitalized upon so that others are free to tinker, to experiment, and to engineer the future? If we truly want to break free from the shackles of our past, we need the imaginings and dreams of a whole new world, of new normals. But we must acknowledge that the process of imagination is constructed in concentrations that uphold pockets of power and privilege that shape our views of what is possible. Adrienne Marie Brown argues, we are in an imagination battle. Imagination turns brown bombers into terrorists and white bombers into mentally ill victims. Imagination gives us borders, gives us superiority, gives us race as an indicator of ability. I often feel I am trapped inside someone else's capability. I often feel I am trapped inside someone else's imagination, and I must engage my own imagination to break free. To design anew, we must ask ourselves, how did humanity arrive at this unique point in time? What systems corral how humanity exists? How do they play out in people's experiences and why? Quite often, those that utilize foresight approaches in change assume emancipation and liberation through systems transformation and reimagination. They leave out a critical understanding of history, of power, of who is deliberately unseen or exploited. Without this analysis, the use of hegemonic foresight might paradoxically expose or expand harm on marginalized, minoritized constituents. You'll notice I've said minoritized because people aren't born into a minority. We are, we are made into a minoritized group. Foresight approaches have traditionally been homogenous in its design and thinking. Born from an ideology of dominant Western perspective, the roots of strategic foresight have maintained its homogeneity regardless of how and where it is applied. It draws on the principles of thinking in causal and strategic ways, extrapolation and imagination. 
It is also based on the fundamental belief, the fundamental idea that all people have the same access and the same ways of thinking about the future. But how is the future talked about in vulnerable contexts? When people juggle crippling poverty or feel unsafe? In contexts where young people do not feel that they have full agency over their own decisions? Where family, culture, religious obligation play a greater role in how their lives play out? What about spaces where indigenous culture and history were overtaken by capitalist labor markets of progress? Whose visions of the future ought to prevail? How do we talk about long-term possibilities when desperation is so much a fundamental presence in a lot of people's lives? Do we consider these issues when we design ideas or solutions about the future? The practice of foresight of imagining the future is not neutral. It is conditioned by our positionality, cultural values, our economic systems, and our capacity for collective imagination. Are we chasing only one idea of what progress looks like? Do we end up replicating versions of ourselves or the stories we want to tell? Foresight can frame our choices and help us choose the pathways ahead of us. However, the more rigid our dependence, the finer the line becomes between foresight seduction and foresight coercion. We end up gently blend, blending, bending our choices, our perspectives, our sense of ourselves to fit these rigid frames, reducing the breadth of our humanity to those templates that are designed and understood by a privileged few. As Audre Lorde said, what does it mean when tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow parameters of change are possible and allowable. To intentionally carve a different type of ideology would require governance systems that are informed by different knowledge sources that tangibly influence decision making and that prioritize a focus not just on the firefighting of today, but on the implications of future generations. How might we embed plurality in governance and ethics? that allow us to consider the connected tissue across the different political infrastructure and social threads that embed deeply affected values that can frame an intentional equity impact. Instead of merely looking at governance in terms of control, could weaving in feminist and decolonial approaches help us liberate our futures so that it is a space of safety, of humanity, are these the approaches in which we can design new forms of humanism? To do so requires going beyond mere diversity and inclusion or lip service nods to power sharing and being participatory. Feminist and decolonial governance is not just about the process of undoing and giving up social and economic power, but rather it is an aspiration to renew, to restore, to elevate, to rediscover to acknowledge and validate the multiplicity of lives, lived experiences, culture and knowledge of indigenous peoples, people of color and colonized people, as well as to decenter hetero and cis normativity, gender hierarchies and racial privilege. I think of this as how we exist in plurality in a multiverse, so, we, so to speak, and to include this in governance, not as a tokenistic or virtue signaling flag, but rather to help us consider different lenses perspectives, sources of truth in how we think about what is right, what is fair, and what is just. It isn't just about getting different underrepresented groups around the table, but rather how might we shift the knowledge and experiences we draw on in the very design and decision making of policy and governance frames. It is to ensure that we are considering the multiplicity of ways in which issues of rights, of privacy, of agency are understood and experienced the world over and not imposing just one or a narrow value judgment on these issues. And while I generally argue for the value of being anticipatory and utilizing foresight as a means of effectively navigating complex risks, it should be noted that it does, I do this with a view to its limitations. Most notably, if one dimension of foresight pertains to considering the future and the well-being and interest of future generations when determining actions, 
The other lies in reconciling with the reality that no matter how sophisticated the analysis methods, the future is still unknown. Likewise, the experience and desires of future generations, while possible to imagine, are impossible to know. This inherent tension does not negate the value of efforts to assess future dynamics, but it ultimately derived from a combination of existing evidence and patterns, informed imagination, and abductive reasoning. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. <laughs> um, so though not meant to be prescriptive or the only approach, my work has attempts to shift from the current approaches to foresight and being anticipatory to more systemic and decolonial and feminist approaches. So I want to give some, a few examples of how this looks like. Current approaches, where there are tight circles of recognized expertise. Current foresight practices see similarity in expertise and little recognition of non-academically qualified protection, uh, practitioners or people with lived experience. To move to a systemic decolonial approach, we want to recognize positionality. When the same group of experts facilitate, facilitate foresight processes and workshops, we continue the same epistemology of knowledge and learning. Whether unconsciously or consciously, we recreate our own image. Current approaches, a narrow epistemology, the frameworks behind foresight tools and approaches have hardly evolved over the last few decades. Though recent years have seen expansion of epistemology in terms of storytelling and concepts of time, this has not translated in a legitimate way to mainstream curricula. A shift would require a legitimacy in pluriversality. Utilizing a wider range of knowledge source and experiences legitimizes multiplicity of conceptual models and prevents the replication of an echo chamber worldview. The, addic the addition of perspective allows us to recognize that multiple truths and multiple realities can exist at the same time and are seen, experienced, imagined, and lived by different groups of people even within the same context. As Arturo Escobar argues in Design for the Pluriverse, we must liberate the imagination to enable other definitions of possible futures. Current foresight practice looks at the four Ps of futures, possible, preferable, plausible, and probable. I argue this is no longer adequate. Its terminology is not easily understood by all people, and it misses the additional layer of the fifth P, perspective. Whose perspective are these four Ps privileging? Current approaches, binary impact assessments, where current tools for impact and implication analysis do not build in any rigorous, explicit, intersectional analysis of structural and systemic inequity. An analysis of privileging forces. Of future, uh, an analysis of privileging forces, which includes patriarchy, race, ethnicity, colonialism, paternalism, heterosis normativity, classism, casteism, ableism, ageism, is important to interrogate the impacts of future design. So moving to a much more forward-looking futures impact assessment. Current approaches, participatory engagement, in an effort to bring diversity and inclusion into futures practice, we have seen a small rise of participatory futures practices. This is very welcomed, absolutely, but by itself is not enough. To move to systemic decolonial approaches, what we need is participatory decision making that are intentionally designed to seek out alternative points of view and ideas that feed into models and then design pathways for such points of views and ideas to influence decision making. So it goes beyond tokenistic diversity and inclusion into as a metric for um, or participation as a metric for mitigating bias. Current practices, hegemonic language. When we use the same language, regardless of whether or not it resonates with people the world over or influences their cultural mental models, the same terms are used to describe approaches and methods regardless of whether it is understood or embraced or whether it can even be translated into local language. When language and terms are not understood, it becomes a form of exclusionary privilege. We shift to democratizing language, when the language of knowledge is so out of touch and reach for many of the world, and we dismiss people's ability to understand it, 
We fail to recognize the fundamental factors needed in democratization, resonance, understanding, and embracing. Democratizing the language of futures to be accessible allows all people to represent their knowledge in ways that best speak to them. And finally, collective visioning. Current visioning focuses on getting to a consensus of a collective probable vision of the future, regardless of what the multiplicity, nuanced, preferable future might be. And we shift to transparent privilege and dispossession. It assesses whose futures are privileged and who's are dispossessed in decision making and the risk of such an assessment in the short and long term horizon. Hope is a radical act. It is what makes us cross seas, take risks, jump without safety nets when the journey and arrival might endanger safety and might diminish us. We are propelled forward by the hope for a better future for our children and our grandchildren. But hope by itself is not enough. We must translate this hope into action that, be, that befits the types of resets we need in the redesign of new commons, values, and wisdoms. Unsettling the coloniality of our governance systems is an act of resistance, an act of resistance to the shackles that have held humanity back from evolving our potential, an act of resistance to the continued practice of designing for, for privilege rather than for equity and justice. And as Bell Hope so eloquently argued, am I educating the colonizer or oppressor class so they can exert better control? If we do not interrogate our motives, the direction of our work, continually we risk furthering a discourse on difference and otherness that not only marginalizes people of color, but actively eliminates the need for our presence. We are living in a time where choices are being taken away from so many of us. So as a brown woman, I stand here in front of you and I say the feminine is not dead, nor is it sleeping. Angry? Yeah. Seething? Hell yeah. To have choice and to have safety in making those choices is the cornerstone of our democracy. We talk about imagination and the power it brings. Anasuya Sengupta once provoked and said that Wakanda isn't just the idea of what could be, but also as a reminder of a past possibility if we are to consider what was taken away. Let us not sleepwalk into unjust, inequitable futures. Another world is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arati. Do you want to have a seat? Or do you want to stay standing? Um, I had two very short questions before I let our panel talk from their perspective and, and ask any questions they had. Um, so one of the, the techniques that has been very successful at CESA recently, we've got a couple of studies coming out using it, is a foresight technique um, called Par Evo, developed by Rick Davies, who may be here or is at least watching online. Um, and it brings in the idea of storytelling to expert communities as a way to support them to see beyond their expert scientific knowledge and to start to tell stories about the future. Um, and it's done in this great way where you can build on each other's stories. So it's an it's a act of co-creation or um, participation, at least within that expert community. And that seemed to me very, before you spoke today, <laughs> something we should be celebrating. I think we should still be celebrating it as a practice because it brings in ideas that, you know, data is not just king, that, that the way that we communicate and make decisions in the world in, in, involves narrative, something we'll hear about more from our other panellists. Um, but hearing the way you're talking, actually maybe that it, we need to go further than that. And, and in your work at UNDP, what are the kinds of tools that, that answer this incredible call to action you've asked for us this evening? Do you have ways that you are working on the ground? Yeah, so we, and again, I'm not putting forward, these ideas are a learning journey for all of us. And it's not mine alone. It's been informed by so many that have informed my practice and my philosophies. One of the things that we did this year, which was really hard to do, by the way, um, we, we were producing a set of um, foresight briefs that was looking to reimagine development in Asia and the Pacific. And the usual way UNDP would do this is to commission academic written papers on various um, topics. Um, we decided to complement this with an imagination process, not by experts, but by civil society. 
And usually, imagination processes, I would have hired the same group of somebody from the same sec, uh, society of consultants we all use that often take a Western developed approach and import it into countries like Laos, like Mongolia, like Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Um, so I went against the grain there and we hired a imagination designer from India who designed an, ima an inclusive, ima what we're calling an inclusive imaginaries toolkit that works, aims to work with people to draw on philosophies, mythology, ideas about how they tell stories that, is, that pertains to the way that is comfortable to them. As, as we, some of us were talking earlier, the way imagination processes have often worked has been grounded in science fiction. In the communities I come from when I was growing up, science fiction wasn't a thing. I didn't know what that was until I moved to Australia. But the way we told stories was myth, the equivalent of a fairy tale or folklore or something like that. Is that a more powerful tool that we can use? Now, it's not a binary argument. I think there's space around the table for everything. But I think our approach that we've been trialing um, has tried to blend multiples of ways to get to prevent our own bias from seeping in. Thank you. Um, and the second question comes from the place of fear that when we think about the catastrophes that could um, come from this century that we're living with that you articulated with, with more doom and gloom than I've heard in a while at the beginning of your talk, um, how do you think we, there's an instinct to put a vivid, often positive utopian <laughs> imagined future in place of that scary future and how do we get away from, I mean, coming back to the Black Mirror question, how do we get away from that desire to put something vivid and calming in place of that doom and actually engage with the messiness of all these different stories, of all these different futures that are probably actually going to be better signals um, for how we make decisions? Because um, it's a very, um, and maybe this is um, a Western policymaker's perspective, but like that, that, it, that is the knee-jerk reaction that leads me to those big Hollywood futures. I don't think it's a future. Aren't we all feeling fairly insecure and anxious already yeah, that's today? True. I know um, when I'm driving in, the, well, when I'm a passenger, when I'm in a car in, um, and driving and the police pull me over, my hands are front and center. So there's no mistaking about whether I've got um, weapons or not. When I'm standing on the platform to take the subway, and you can see this, we're not standing on the yellow line. We're standing right back up against the wall because somebody is, has and will attack us. How many women here walk back um, with a whistle or something or their car keys in their hands if you're walking back alone at night? How many of you have gone on a Tinder date and texted your friend your location and a get out clause quickly. Hands up. How many men have done that? One. It's not a scary, it's not this dystopian future. We are living the dystopia today. We are living the dystopia that so many of us that come from minoritized, marginalized communities experience this oppression, whether it's on, um, like small strokes of it or big, vicious, aggressive strokes of it. So the challenge for us is to not necessarily buy into a mainstream utopia that we wish we lived, but is to recognize that not all of us have safety in our lives, even if we are from mainstream communities. That's the story we need to tell. It's not a dystopic future, it's just to bring to light the microaggressions and macroaggressions that many of us are facing now and to tell the truth of those stories in a way that, yes, it is uncomfortable, but in that discomfort lives our liberation. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Ben. <laughs> Um, and we've all dressed in red this evening <coughs> for, for Futures Day. Um, no, Ben, ben Yeo is a, is a playwright and investor, which is an unusual combination of, of skills and careers, um, but a great one too. And, and therefore does play with big bets on the future in some of your work, um, but also 
big games about different kinds of fictional stories we could tell about the future. And I, I'd just love to hear some of your responses to what Rati said. Sure. So, hi, I'm Ben. Um, my father came from Malaysia, my mum from Singapore, uh, through Chinese extraction, but I was born uh, in London. And I was very fortunate to have these kind of dual careers. So one as a, a theatre maker and another as an investor on, uh, for other people's pension funds, particularly with a view to sustainable or long-term investing kind of quite broadly, uh, broadly defined. So I don't have an answer to those very big uh, calls, but I have a kind of nudges of some of the things in uh, my work and practice around how actually maybe some of this could be in the question an opportunity. So understanding obviously where we are is uh, a sort of a prerequisite for where we can go to and, and some of these kind of maybe emerging ideas or techniques uh, to do some of that. So within the theatre making or uh, the storytelling, which you know traditionally was a very kind of Western tradition back to Aristotle, uh, that in today's day and age has actually uh, really opened up um, you know, still a long way to go, but other forms of, of drama making and theatre making. And it is also no longer just uh, an audience and players on the stage. There's always been an understanding that a play or live performance is not complete unless you have an audience. And in fact, this is true across all of those art forms. Uh, dance, painting, a book. A book is actually, to a lot of extent, not complete unless you have a reader. And that's the other half of uh, the myth-making that has. And I think there's a, a growing understanding of that, which has then got into practice. So um, I used to chair a theatre company called Coney, and one of the uh, big themes through Coney was not only play, but participatory theatre or using your agency. So here, theatre makers would guide audiences or players to help create their own stories. The variance between very open-ended mass creation to those which were somewhat guided. And then out of those stories comes actually a, a plethora of different narratives. Now, there are still the challenges of, of reaching those audiences and there's still the challenges of the systems and the money and all of that. But in terms of the techniques used to open out those agencies and so that audiences feel that they're co-creating and making those stories and, and they take their stories with them. With part of the ultimate aim always being within theatre making, that you leave different to how you started. Actually, all good art does that. And all good art can only do that with participation. If you're not present in whatever form, you don't leave any different. Mm. Uh, and so great art within that, and, th and that has moved within uh, theatre making. And then they borrowed from uh, a lot of these other forms of sources, whether that's kind of Boal and other places like that. And so uh, I'm on the board of another theatre company called Improbable, which does a lot of work with improvisation. But a big strand of their work has also evolved around uh, the kind of technology called open space, which has been about. And that's essentially a participatory form of meeting of where you get, again, you've got the problems of you've got to get the people in the room and then the people in the room, you know, have their own power dynamics. But at least the process is participatory, that everyone brings their own ideas and they're equal and you move your feet to go to the places which are more interesting. And from those ideas, uh, things are meant to shape and your future and your narrative um, is shaped like that. And those, those are very powerful kind of ideas and tools which actually are shaping or starting to shape a different form of, of progress or a different form of future. Now, it is within all of the issues and problems which has been this challenge, but there, there, is a, there is a kind of subtle difference on that. And so I kind of remain hopeful that this uncertainty can get these different outcomes and variations of progress, even though the journey... Um, in Egypt, though the journey is, is starting. And actually that goes into uh, the world of investments. And here it's kind of really interesting because uh, I think there's a, a growing acceptance really around the narratives and the myths that we tell ourselves within investing. We sort of always know this, right? The, one of the central defining myths of humanity is, is money. I mean, what if that is not the ultimate myth? Mm. We have this trust that this thing which the parrot or the dog can't touch and doesn't care about, and yet it's the central exchange, really, along with the, potentially a few other things of, wh of whether it is. 
But it is a myth that we tell ourselves as a, as a narrative, and we can, we can kind of change or, or grapple with where that is. So if you go back a few hundred years ago, you know, we had a different myth on, on slavery where it is today. And if you fast forward to sort of maybe more recent or current history, um, the cash flow, say, or the data points in, in financial accounting associated with tobacco is not considered the same cash flow that is associated with other companies. 20, 30 years ago, that was different. Today, that cash flow is treated differently. Now, it is sort of fungible. We have this sort of system and, and things like that. But actually, if you compare to where we, we were, the narrative around the tobacco cash flow has changed. In more extremists, you have the cash flow associated with, sort of, say, landmines, which actually, to all instincts and purposes, are not within the investable world anymore. That has disappeared because of the changing narratives and myths that investors in the financial markets have, have told themselves. Those are kind of more at the edge. And then we have the sort of current battles of narratives. Call it fossil fuels, call it alcohol, call it all of these other kind of, uh, of things. And those are very live, right? There are no answers. But is it an opportunity? I think it is an opportunity. It's what, one we may not grasp, but I think we have got, uh, we have got that sense. And when you, th when you think about that, it also comes with these different narratives about what long-term investing will be or what long-termism might be. And actually, even throughout that, there are, there are these different shades and narratives coming through. And there isn't necessarily, when you kind of put in that one dominant one as yet, they are all in play. And I kind of, it's up to us, you know, the more influential in this room, to bring others and into it so that those stories and narratives can live. And I'll, I'll finish on one last one with even in the world of uh, investing, is that this understanding from people like me who are, who are managing pension funds on behalf of other people. Uh, so often these are trustees and these are trustees on behalf of the person in the street or the woman in the pub. And actually they are starting to come essentially into the room. It's only the beginning of the journey. So they can make themselves be heard uh, through protests and letters and the like. But for instance, in our own practice, we would invite what we call pension fund asset owners uh, to meet with company management. They actually own these pieces of shares for these companies, and they can influence and have that conversation and the narrative about, well, why is it we do this? Why do we not do this? And that is also a beginning of, of the shaping of the new narratives, because that's uh, companies give themselves purpose, give themselves mission statements, right? Those are essentially the stories of the myths that they tell themselves. And they are shaped by, yeah, their board and the management, but they are shaped by their employees, by their customers, by their shareholders, by everything else. There's, and there's an understanding of that. I mean, we've dressed it up in these terms of stakeholders and yada, yada, but it, it really is that actually from many years ago, those being not in the room, they are starting to uh, um, be there and al allowed to be there and invited to be there and we can do more. So is that an opportunity? I think that is also an opportunity. And I think I would put that broadly under a heading of some sort of progress, a kind of messy sort of progress, not one where you have a necessary consensus, but a, a much wider view on what is possible than where we were maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago in, in either of those domains. Thank you so much. I, that's a fascinating connection that, that actually the uncertainty we had in the title of this is about the uncertainty of the, the future. But what we're talking about here is the changing and uncertainty in the process for how we think about the future, providing new opportunities for new people to come in and to augment those processes themselves. Um, if that's not too many levels of remove. Correct. So not, not to make it too meta, but I think if, if you're, it never would be, but if you had such a set future vision it wouldn't allow that uncertainty in process because it'd be like, well, I am king and this is the way it is and therefore obviously it will be. And, and so you don't, don't, you, you don't get that um, plurality of views or processes. So in that sense, that uncertainty and the, that wide range that we're coming out does allow this within, within the process, at least taking that from the title. Thank you, Ben. Um, so I'm going to move to Ella now, um, our other kind of coordinated partner in crime. Um, so Ella is, amongst many things, co-founder of the Long Time 
um, project. Um, and I'll let you explain what connections you see. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier today, so feel free to repeat anything we said there because we have a different audience Great. with us now. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Firstly, thank you, Arati, for your work. Um, one of the many things I love about what you do is the way you give form to the practice that some of us are developing in a very emerging way. Uh, and it's kind of a relief when I hear you speak. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. <laughs> I hadn't put that language or name to it. So, like, in addition to pioneering practice, the work you're doing to kind of build a narrative around it is really awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ella Saltmarsh. Um, I am the co-founder of the Long Time Project. Um, and so the work that we do is all about how do we cultivate uh, cultures of stewardship at scale. So the reason that we're doing this work is because we think that if as societies, we want to be able to tackle these huge existential risks we face. There are certain core values it would be really helpful for most of us to have. And one of those is a very ancient value, which is a value of stewardship. So how would it be if everyone in this room, everyone in this university, everyone in this country, thought of themselves as ancestors, which is the reality. All of us, whether we have children or we don't have children, are ancestors to the world to come. And if we don't see ourselves as ancestors, we're probably likely to be quite bad ancestors. Um, so how do we start to cultivate this idea that we are all stewards? And, and, how, and the work that we do is um, quite pragmatic about that. So we work with governments, uh, we look at how we help institutions become good ancestors, but we also work with popular culture to look at how do we cultivate these values at scale. Um, one of the projects that we do is a partnership with Headspace, the meditation app, uh, with its quite vast community of 30 million users, um, and we've created the Longtime Academy podcast. And actually, you know, when I hear Arati speak, you know, what we're doing in that is, is putting into practice a lot of those ideas. So one of the key things we're doing there is, um, I read a phrase of yours earlier, uh, which is this idea of uh, pluralistic epistemology. So, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, give a platform for many different ways of thinking about the future. Um, we are helping people cultivate that muscle that is the ability to engage with the future by giving them loads of different ways of doing that. Lots of them uh, are ways of engaging with the future that come from indigenous cultures, that come from different parts of the world, that aren't the ways of engaging with the, with the future that are often prioritized in the centers of power. And whenever we work with the centres of power, we always start with a practice. So recently, the Canadian government asked me to come and run a session for about 2,000 civil servants. And I began it, as I always begin these sessions, with a long-time meditation, with a practice, um, which is a practice that involves walking backwards across time and forwards to the future. Um, and we always begin with that practice because we are trying to engage people first as ancestors. Um, and second in terms of their institutional identity. And every time I run that practice, I'm like, they're gonna think I'm a massive weirdo. <laughs> they're gonna think I'm a huge hippie. This is gonna be a disaster. But it, it, I, I swear, it has never backfired. And when we, don't, when we don't run embodied meditative processes at the start of these sessions, the engagement of policymakers is so much poorer. So, so, so that really spoke to me, this idea of, you know, and that's what we're trying to do with this, is, is how, do we, how do we work to develop more spaces, more voices in what it means to engage with the future? Um, one of the things that I um, was reflecting on today is we developed this term long-timeism to distinguish us from all the long-termism <laughs> folk. <laughs> Um, and one of the reasons that we've done that is, I guess, because of our work is all about cultivating care for the future. So we say long timeism is about cultivating care for the future. And that a lot of the tools and techniques that we use might be the same uh, as the tools and techniques that are used in long termism, things like backcasting, very useful. We use that a lot. But a lot of them are very different because cultivating an emotional 
connection, a sense of care for the future does involve a different set of tools. It, it doesn't have some of that same baggage, that colonial baggage of traditional foresight. And so I think for me, today's lecture raises a question of being really clear about why we're invoking the future. Um, is it so that we as a small, powerful minority group are better prepared for that future? Or is it so that all of us as a collective, including all of the kind of non-humans who don't have a voice in this, is it about ensuring all of us as a collective have a better future? Um, so it raises those kinds of questions. Um, and I think, I mean, I've got lots of questions that I'd love to ask you. Um, but I think one of them is this question you asked about, um, for me, it feels like a question about kind of distress and complexity and how, you know, we're living in these ever more chaotic times um, and, and how we create places and spaces for people to be generative in such chaos. Yeah, I'm really curious. Oh. Um, well, I don't have to put the answer to that, but before that, I just want to say I love your work and I promote your work out to our network because it's so easily understood and graspable and it just uses such a multitude of approaches that I love and it's not wedded to one. So if you haven't checked out Ella's work, absolutely do. Um, I think one of the things that gives, that I draw on personally is I look for where the helpers are. Mm -hmm. So we are in chaotic times. We are in distressing times. My job requires me to look at the worst of all of us um, and the worst of what might be to come. But that doesn't feed my soul. It doesn't feed my solidarity with my fellow person, with my fellow non-person. It doesn't feed love, it doesn't feed joy. So I look for where the helpers are. Who is, who is the one that is driving mutual aid organizations? Who are the ones that are advocating, the activists that are putting their lives in, in peril to drive a change, whether that's in Iran, whether that's in uh, Pakistan, whether that's in Sri Lanka, whether that's in the United States, whether that's here in, in the UK? Who are the helpers? Do they inspire joy? Do they inspire solidarity? And I think when we look at where the help is where the help is concentrated, that's where we find the regenerative practices. And not to say that that's not um, difficult at times, because as we know, social good work and for good work can also be quite problematic. But I think when we want to look at what can be regenerative for our souls, of the way we connect with each other and for our planet, just look at where the helpers are. Thank you. Um, so that we get some <laughs> time for other questions in the room. I'm going to move now on to Genevieve. We could talk about this more later. Um, and Professor Genevieve Lively is from the University of Bristol. Um, and fantastic to have you here in person, someone we've talked to a long time on Zoom. Um, and is, is um, also a, a fellow at the, um, why can't I remember, the Turing Institute, I'm going to call it Centre. So has an interesting... Um, joint career both in, in literature and classics and also talking to computer scientists um, often about narrative. Um, I wonder, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your responses and how that relates to the work you do in practice. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, that was, was awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm a classicist and uh, so hearing people talk about myths and narrative is, is, is clearly just, you know, I felt really at home. <laughs> um, I also wanted to pick up on something, Arathi, you said in, in your amazing paper, we're living in the days of future history lessons. Just just gorgeous and so potent and so so right right <laughs> um, and I think engaging in that sense that th this is this is history right now and um, we were talking about time and temporality earlier and how you know the past doesn't exist because it's in the past the future doesn't exist doesn't happen I'm being all Aristotelian and Augustinian on your on yourself um, but of course all we have is the present but of course we don't because it's always out of step with with where we are so we just make sense of, of, of what we've got. Um, and how we do that is, is the kind of the sort of quiet exam question for today, isn't it? I think that's something that all of us have been thinking about. Um, and Arathi, as you pointed out so, so beautifully, one of the problems that we all encounter in trying to make sense of these, these anticipations and, uh, and, and future sense making is a, a failure of the imagination. That, that's where we are really going to, to could 
sell ourselves short and fail, fail ourselves, fail the present, fail the past and fail the future. Um, and so one of the things that I do in my work to try and address that imagination deficit um, and across the board, I mean, it's particularly noticeable among some of our honourable leaders and decision makers, but hey ho. Um, <laughs> but how, how do we foster that imagination? And we've just had some fantastic examples of, of how we might do that. And, and UNESCO uh, calls for, I'm a big Real Miller fan girl, um, but the UNESCO Futures Literacy Campaign calls for more rigorous imagining for us to really become, you know, the, the kind of futures thinking animals that we need to be if we're going to kind of work ourselves out of um, some of the dystopian futures that, that we've been imagining and feel ever more, more present. Um, the concept of futures literacy is really fascinating for me um, because, of course, I come from a world of, of literature um, and myth and, 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 and storytelling. And one of the benefits, I think, of, of, of futures literacy and, and a futures literate approach is we can share that literacy around. There are, there are layers and levels of literacy, right? We don't all have to have PhDs in, in futures to be able to participate in this act. We can have a, but we do all, everyone needs a, some proficiency. Um, so the exam question today was, you know, is uncertainty about the future an opportunity for greater equality? It's a great question, Jess. But the answer is clearly no, right? We, that's a really quick session. No, it ain't. But what might it be an opportunity for? And I think it might be an opportunity for, for thinking about what does, what does futures literate, you know, negotiation with these questions look like? What's the bare minimum that, you know, the people at the top, the people in the middle, the people, the rest of us need to know about these anticipatory processes, our assumptions, the biases, the heuristics, the narratives that we use to make those futures, understand those futures, communicate, not just the art of the possible and the probable, but perspective. Again, storytelling, drama, it's all about point of view. Um, and once we need, you know, we need to understand that, that better. Um, I've scribbled so many notes, Arthur, because that was, that was just gorgeous. Um, but I keep coming back to this, this, this metaphor of the mirror. Um, and of course, I've got Charlie Brooker in the back of my head in, and, and the black mirror in the dystopian model as well. And I, I really like it. I think it's, it's really good to think with in this context. And I've got in mind, clearly, I grew up in a, in a scabby old damp house where the mirrors would get that sort of speckled effect. And I think that's the kind of mirror that I, it might be useful for us to think with here. So there are some bits that seem really clear, but there are some dark bits. It's not a, a black mirror or, or a crystal clear one. It's got that sort of, uh, that kind of speckled textured. And that spoke to me, I think, very, of, of the, the metaphor you used as well, of the mosaic. Of futures. This isn't going to be, you know, kind of black and white or just fuzzy. There's going to be a mosaic of, 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 of kind of different, different colours, different coloration, discoloration, um, and that sort of age speckled futures. I'm always interested as a literary scholar in the concept of used futures. Um, Spielberg, lots of cinema do this really well, the, the used future, um, and how we might use that to, to kind of harness our own imagination. You also brought out the point beautifully, which I kind of want to linger on for a moment, that participation in and of itself is necessary, but not sufficient. That's not going to get us to, you know, better places where we need to be. And again, I think futures literacy is, is, is something that we can harness to kind of broader participation here. It's not just about, you know, showing up. It's about, you know, knowing what questions to ask, knowing when you're being spun a line. So I, I'd, I'd kind of like to see those two kind of married up. Um, some of the kind of key um, messages that, that emerge from all of our, our conversations earlier this afternoon um, and all the things that we're talking about today, we need more reflective practice. And we, we need, some of you guys already, you know, are doing this. We need more collective practice, more inclusive, more contextual, more co-produced practice. We need decentered practice, more plural and more imaginative practice. And I think this is, this is a great you know, roadmap to, to show us how we get there. And I just want to finish with, um, I, I suppose it's kind of a question, but I, it's one of those ones where I think I, I have the answer. Um, <laughs> you, you talk about the importance of hope. It's a kind of lawyer's question. It's like, you talk about the importance of hope. Um, and absolutely, that, that, that's really crucial. 
Um, and as I, oh, I get an extra point every time I mention a Greek myth. I'm saving up for a soda stream. So <laughs> I want to, to just kind of share with you. So in, in the Greek, when, when, you know, when um, all the, Pandora opens the jar and all the, you know, all the bad things come out and hope is trapped inside, um, we talk about that as hope. The Greek elpis, though, really suggests a different word to, to most classicists, which is anticipation. It's a kind of futures focused mm. um, kind of sense. And I wondered if, if as well as hope, what, what, how else might we think of hope? Is anticipation a, a, good, a good kind of framing um, term? Is anticipatory governance one of the, the kind of modes that we need to help us harness that hope? Is anticipatory governance the mechanisms in which we harness hope? Is it, is, can, can we put those together? Um, it, huh. are, they, are they helpfully aligned or, or not? <laughs> You've stumped me. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> would um, you like to send me a postcard? For a yeah, I will. Um, I think hope is an act of resistance. I think hope is the thing that we say that we have to hold on to with every fiber of our being when the dystopic black mirror uh, future and reality wants to take over. I don't know if anticipatory governance, just because it's understood in very different ways, it, it plays, it can be quite a technical process. Um, whereas hope for me, and this is so personal, but hope for me when in the face of everyone and everything seemingly being so full of despair that it is my act of resistance to say, nope, I'm still turning up to work. I'm still going to roll up my sleeves and get on with this because there is work yet to be done. So the way to harness hope, I think, is to look at it as a form of resistance in the face of all those that will want to tear us down, all those that will say joy has no place in this world today. Um, and I say, actually, joy does. What does it mean to design for joy rather than for dystopia? You know, does that mean that we look at work not just in terms of putting food on the table or in terms of livelihoods, but we look at work in terms of dignified work, where I don't have to work three jobs just so that I have insurance or I can send my kids to school. I can work one job, and I can feel fulfilled by it, and I can be proud. So yeah, hope is an act of resistance for me. Thank you. There's more to be said. We have um, just under 10 minutes. I'd love to get some reflections and hopefully questions from the audience. Um, I think there's a microphone. It's still here. Let me get it for you. Um, so please put your hand up if you have a question. There's one at the front, which I'm going to ignore for the moment because it's from my colleague. Anyone who doesn't work with me got a question? <laughs> yeah, there's two over there, and then we'll come to Paul at the front. I did ask you to, I know, I know, it's unfair. <laughs> Hi, can, can you hear me all right? I cool. can. Cheers. Um, yeah, I wanted to like, um, thank everybody for your, um, for your talks. I think it was all like, um, like incredibly interesting. I think that like, the kind of like, the field of, it's like a very kind of like, um, f breath of fresh air for like, everything that I know about the field of, like, existential risk studies in the sense that, like, I think that, uh, like, one of the things that I've been disappointed with in learning more about people who are talking about these kind of existential risks is, like, a lack of concern for, like, justice in transition for preparing for existential risk. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that I think that, especially these people who are, like, very concerned with truly, like, the kind of, like, total destruction of humanity, like, that seems to be something that in every conversation is always outweighing everything that kind of goes on um, in terms of like justice in transition. So it's, it's interesting to kind of to hear this, that being brought up in the discussion. My question that I wanted to ask was like, I feel like I'm slightly more skeptical about the kind of power of storytelling as a means for kind of understanding and designing a hopeful future. Because I think that like one of the things that like storytelling captures, especially in media, um, it's like it's some it's design, design is useful for designing futures that kind of people can latch onto with the imagination, but that's not necessarily something that is going to be something that captures the whole space of possibilities. So I wonder if like 
boring apocalypses are going to be something that slips through the cracks um, with this kind of technique of encouraging the imagination and pathways for the future. But yeah, I would be interesting, interested to hear your takes on that. It's a great question. Let's, do you want to start with that? I thought we may take two. If there's one more over here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I, thanks for that. Uh, also, sort of building off the last question, I feel like we've heard um, sort of about practice in the realm of policy making and cultural work in investing in the economic sphere, storytelling. I'm curious to know your thoughts on on the role of maybe more traditional politics um, in in, in which is an, an imperfect term, but but of, of sort of actually seizing control of, of the levers of, of power at this moment when so many of our political systems seem to be in, in, in disarray. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just do a quick shout out to two of my colleagues before you answer the first one. Um, because I, I think you're right that sometimes when discussing existential catastrophic risk, there is this particular set of features that people um, focus on. Um, and I'll point you towards a paper written by my colleagues um, Matthias Mass, um, Lita Sundrum, and S.J. Beard, which are seven questions for existential risk studies. And the seventh question is exactly this. It's how do we sit comfortably with uncertainty um, in face of these, these huge risks? Um, and the desire really is to, to put some other vivid image in place instead. And, and um, one of our colleagues, the other one I would mention, um, Lara Mani's work, which works on the ground, um, particularly with people responding um, to disasters and how communication happens within those communities points to some different, different, um, different directions that those who work in existential risk studies are going. But it is, yeah, it is a, is a question for our moment in this, in this discipline. Um, but I'll let you answer that for more. The wider community beyond our, our centre. <laughs> I mean, I think Ella uh, may also have some really interesting viewpoints here with, with the podcast um, and certainly with the work from the theatre from Ben. Uh, so I'm going to answer this question from the perspective of my work, which is very much around how we shift policy cycles. The first deal is that how we are taught about how policy is structured and designed and implemented is not how policy is structured and designed and implemented. How policy changes is because of influence, of advocacy. Is storytelling the one tool? Is imagination the one tool? No, it is not. I could not pass any kind of rigor in my work if that was the only tool I used. However, I think, again, because I'm not a fan of binary approaches, I think plurality of approaches is absolutely needed when you need to influence. Now, as, um, as you graduate and get out into the workforce, one of the skill sets I will strongly encourage you to pick up and learn and hone. I wasn't taught this, I had to learn this when I entered, uh, you know, when I started um, moving on in my career, was the ability to influence people. We're not taught that. So what will influence change? Evidence and rigor, data, stories, experiential emotions, Understanding what is the leverage, the lever that needs to be tweaked for the decision maker to change something, that, that's what you got to aim for. So if your purpose is to achieve a specific uh, policy or po political or strategic change, understand first what will need to happen for that change to occur. Do not assume that if you write a good report, that change will occur. If you, write, if you run a fantastic workshop, that change will occur because that will not be how it. Change happens in the corridors. It's in conversations. It's in whether somebody trusts you to hold them in protection as you take them through a process. And so your credibility, your ability to influence, your ability to advocate, your ability to blend rigor, analysis, imagination, and stories all come together in a wonderful way, but it's very, very, very hard to do. Thank you. I'm not sure if Ella or Ben or um, I, I can add just briefly on, on the storytelling, one from you know, a few hundred years ago, you know, I mentioned it briefly, uh, was the end of sort of legal slavery. And it was multifactorial, but one of the important elements was a, was a story that the Quakers were telling about a vision which could be different. And there are other factors with it, but without that, that story that they were telling, uh, 
it seems to be that that probably wouldn't have happened. Why did it happen then than 100 years earlier or could have been later? So I, I do think that was a key component on something which was really big. And you can talk about women's rights, minority rights and things uh, further down. If you think about something kind of small and boring uh, within the corporate form, uh, the corporate form really hasn't changed for a kind of couple of hundred uh, years. Um, but more recently, uh, we've had a new form called the B Corps. Uh, it may or may not uh, take off uh, because it's a new story that we're telling us about what businesses can do. Uh, so it's, it's one we may or may not be writing, the fu future history of that. But if it's one which catches in our imaginations, then it, become, it could become a potentially the dominant form of business, or at least a significant form. That's kind of boring. So was limited liabilities companies, which is you know, arguably how we had the dominant corporate form there. Uh, and that's just a small story, maybe small, maybe big story uh, that we're telling ourselves. So I, I think those, um, again, maybe not the only factor, but they certainly are, I think, a, a factor. And then the one on the politics is um, there are flashes of where some of these things are getting unpicked by maybe some of these newer governance models or things of talking about. So I think about Taiwan and their digital minister. Mm -hmm. uh, you should look at what Audrey Tang, what they have done uh, uh, around, around there. And there has been some, some things using some, in fact, uh, Audrey themselves came through uh, the Sunrise Movement and open space and they're using <laughs> some of these things. But there were, there were things to do with uh, marriage laws within Taiwan, which were, which were settled. Uh, there were things to do with uh, similar and abortion laws within Ireland, which were uh, unpicked by some of these uh, types of things as well. So there has been flashes of these type of things unclogging even within politics, even though we think some of these big things are, are stuck where they have. I, 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 I would claim that there have been some pockets of progress, which are worth looking out for because, say, that digital democracy that Taiwan has, may, maybe that's the spark which will go further. And if those are the stories that we're, we're convinced by, uh, there might be more to them. Thank you. I'm aware that we're, we're close to time. So, I mean, yes, in one sentence, please sum up your answers to those three questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's everything else you have to say about the future of the world. No, it'd be great to hear from, from Ella and from <coughs> Genevieve, and, the, and then we'll close up um, for the live stream, but we can stay around for, for more discussion afterwards. I can say really quickly that I, I think being imaginative isn't the same as being dramatic. We don't have to imagine, you know, you, I think you said it was sort of a boring apocalypse. You know, that's, I would kind of settle for that right now. Um, but, but it's not about imagining the big, you know, dystopian visions or, you know, heaven on a stick with utopian. And the imagination can, can, can layer up and imagine lots of kind of a more granular future. And, and I think it's, it's just, at the moment, the dial just needs shifting a little bit. We're not in that, in that sort of Hollywood terrain in most of the future's work, particularly with the work we do with government and policy makers, just shifting the dial a little bit into the realm of more creative thinking around futures is, is a good thing at the moment. There may be a future, we may be sitting here in 10, 15 years' time when it's moved too far. And you can ask us that question again, and we will try and backtrack really fast. I'll be quiet. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, they're both really interesting questions. I think the question about storytelling depends on what we understand by a story. Because narrative is the soil from which everything in our society grows. It's what our policy, our technology, our law, all of it is based in story that is much more profound than the idea of storytelling. And so all of us, we're swimming in a sea of narrative that is invisible to us. We are like marionettes to mm. these deep cultural narratives that are shaping our collective trajectories. So when we talk about working with story, we're talking about working with it on many levels. Yes, we're talking about storytelling, but we're also talking about how do we make visible these deep narratives that are taking us towards destruction at speed and how do we start to cultivate new ones um, and then to this question of, of politics and how do we seize control <laughs> um, I mean one of the very pragmatic reasons we work with values of stewardship is it because they are one of the few values um, that both left and right share they are a way of accessing responsibility for the future um, without people regressing to familiar political terrains. And so I think 
thinking about how... Uh, and so we're very intentional and we're working at the moment with a lot of activist movements. We're working with the RSPB, one of the largest federated organisations in the UK who've just come out fighting this week, <laughs> um, to think about actually how do we use these tools that enable communities who might be divided politically to find a point of unity when it comes to responsibility to the future. Um, so, you know, stewardship is our friend in many ways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not that we'll be ending the conversation now, but just to bring this section to a close. It's interesting that you come back to the value of, of data and technical insights. And, and I think you're right that what we're doing is reacting somewhat to that being the dominant narrative. And particularly during COVID, um, there was almost a regression to the scientific expert being the, the god of all decision making. And, and we are... Um, in somewhat ways responding to that today. So I think it was, a, it was an excellent question. And just a final plug, we have for another week um, two open vacancies at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. And one of them is in global systems as, as a, it's a postdoc position. Um, and it, it's interesting to think about that position because it's exactly in this difficult territory between thinking about hugely complex systems that are so uncertain that cannot be predicted with any data set yet trying to bring appropriately together different forms of information to lead to change. And all of that is going to, at different points, require narrative, require data, require us checking ourselves against um, all of those ideas and, and biases that come into them. Um, so it's a great job. I'm not actually sure anyone can do it, but, <laughs> um, but we are advertising for it um, right now. So yeah, I'm, this, is a, this has been a great conversation. I think more to come. Um, within the Caesar family. We will have another public lecture hopefully next term and I look forward to seeing you, those, those of you who are based in Cambridge then. Um, stay around for another 15 minutes or so um, before allowing you to enjoy your evenings. Thank you. May I finish with one thing? Of course. Okay. I just want to say this. Um, it's just a short thing. It's not just the future that matters. Who models the future matters? Who tells the story of these futures matter too? who leads the facilitation, the modeling, and storytelling of these futures also matters. And who gets powerful due to these futures matters most. Authored Arathika Krishnan, 2022. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.